Hello and welcome to the ILO's Future of Work podcast. I'm Sophie Fisher. In this programme, we're going to take a close look at something that's at the heart of the ILO's mandate. That's International Labour Standards, or ILS as we sometimes call them. ILS have been a cornerstone of the ILO's work since the organisation was founded in 1919. They play an essential role in countering work-related exploitation and inequality, creating a level playing field for business and ensuring that the global economy delivers benefits for everyone, everywhere. But the world of work is changing all the time, faster now perhaps than ever before. That means that international labour standards have to change too, if they're to stay up to date and be useful. And they have to do this while at the same time being relevant for all the ILO's member states at whatever level of development or social or economic culture. That's a pretty tough brief. So how is it achieved? How are labour standards created and kept relevant? And where might they go next? Well, One person who knows this very well is Tim DeMeyer, Senior Advisor on Standards Policy in the International Labour Standards Department at the ILO. Tim, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Sophie. Pleasure to be here. Right. Let's start with some of the basics about ILS. What are the different types? Formally speaking, there are three types. There are international labour conventions, which are legally binding. There are international labor recommendations, which are not supposed to be legally binding. And then you have a third type that is occasionally used, uh, protocols that can only be ratified. They're open for ratification, but it can only be ratified if the convention to which they are associated are ratified. Right. And we currently have, there's currently a list of 190 conventions uh, on the ILO website, but not all of them are still live and relevant? Some of them have been superseded, is that correct? That is correct. Um, There is actually only a minority that is uh, today uh, fully considered up to date. Now, exactly exactly which ones are and which ones aren't, that is the job of a specific uh, tripartite working group, the Standards Review Mechanism Tripartite Working Group, that advises the governing body to take uh, decisions in that that respect. What is um, important to note is that on the same subject, international labor standards have been revised by the International Labor Conference, uh, sometimes several times over time. And the most prominent example, um, certainly not the only one, is probably Night Work for Women, where in 1919 we moved from a uh, complete prohibition of the night work of women to the standard that we adopted in the uh, the early 90s, where we considered, accepted uh, that night work is potentially hazardous, is it's uh, somewhat unsocial, it is not particularly healthy, but for men and women alike, um, but where employment opportunities are available to men, they should also be there for women. So that's a, consi- that's a considerable shift in... So that's mindset. a good example of how we have to keep them up to date when kind of social and economic thinking changes. Correct. Right. Okay. So and let's take it back to basics. Why is it important that we have these international labour standards? And, and what, is, what is their kind of overall purpose? Because I can see people saying, well, why should my workplace standards be set by an international body? They are part of my right to position my country competitively. Um, who are you to tell us that we can't open for longer hours or we have to do this in terms of occupational safety and health? It may be against my culture. Correct. There's um, historically two main purposes behind international labour standards. One is actually to facilitate international trade and investment because understandably uh, certain countries will only be willing to open their markets to uh, goods for a variety of reasons to goods uh, and services that are being produced under uh, decent uh, working conditions decent uh, labor standards so the, the first purpose you could refer to uh, as and is often referred to as the uh, the level playing field the other one is that also internally um 
given that international labor standards benchmark what we call decent work, it's important that that these uh, benchmarks are clearly articulated and are um, supported by those who will actually have to give effect to them. And these are the two sides of the labor market, the workers and the employers' organizations. So they're also instruments, if you wish, of, of economic and social development. So you might say, for example, if I'm a, um, uh, an employer with a factory in one country and I have a competitor in another country which has lower standards and perhaps is using children it's not fair on me because clearly they may be not paying those children at all or paying them a lot less. And so my goods are going to be undercut by them because they're doing things that are deemed to be um, unacceptable. Correct. That is, well, certainly that is perhaps even the most prominent aspect of it. But there is also the aspect um, in the country where child labour occurs is that eventually, if you want to maintain international peace and stability, everyone has an interest in making sure that certain exploitative practices are eradicated as soon as possible. Because, in your example, if um, this international trade flow is sustained with these exploitative practices in place, chances are that um, that has, in the longer term, a destabilizing economic and social effect on the on the country where uh, these goods are coming from, and that is uh, eventually not in the uh, the long term interest of, um, shall we say, the business community more widely, not just any particular employer. Because I mean, if these kids are, are are working, they're not in school. So as you try to move Correct. the country up the economic ladder to create more sophisticated products, they're not going to have the skill set exactly. because they've been too busy making low-grade products and not exactly. going to school. Exactly. Right, okay. All right, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about how ILS are created. Where, where do the initial ideas come from? The initial ideas can come from uh, many, many different mm -hmm. sources, but let me give perhaps one example to... Um, the Convention and Recommendation number 189 and um, 200 and... 200 and something. Um, 189 is domestic workers, yeah? Correct. Yeah. That's the example of the domestic workers. Um, the first time that the conference actually suggested a potential future standard setting on uh, domestic workers was in 1936, and that was then followed up uh, by resolutions of the conference in 1946, in 1948, and a number of times after that. Always the idea being that domestic workers, of course, are, are a category of workers that very often work, uh, not just in poor working conditions, but out of social control, out of uh, the sight of um, social supervision, uh, which are always hidden circumstances, as some of our standards uh, tend to refer tend to refer to it. So it's, it's by nature a vulnerable group. Um, what is interesting is that over time, and what probably at some point made the difference in deciding to move towards standard setting, is that domestic workers in the overall labor market have, um, have an important, increasingly important function. And in particularly in those countries where um, gender equality has... Um, has been seen to undergo significant change. It's very important to help uh, women uh, access labor market um, if they have, if they can afford indeed, and if they have domestic work, uh, that will take uh, out of their hands uh, a certain amount of household responsibilities. So, there were, we first started talking about domestic worker, um, a labor standard on domestic work in the 1930s, and that convention was finally passed by the ILC in... In 2011. 20... Not everything takes that long. Not everything takes that long, that's correct. Um, and obviously there are standards that we are now just recently decided uh, to be setting in 2025 and 2026. So the, the standards I'm referring to is on the protection of uh, workers in the platform economy. Right. So let, let's take that as an example. The first step would be that there would be some sort of general consensus among the ILO's membership that work needs to be done in 
platform economy workers or in a particular area. And where would that idea then go? Would it go to a technical committee or would it go straight to the conference or what? How, how, what's the process that it follows? It very often starts with um, suggestions that can come up, for example, through one of the so-called recurrent discussions uh, at the International Labour Conference. Um, in the case of the platform economy, and I forget now the exact year, but it must have been um, 2017, 2018, 2019, it came up, it came up in the discussions. Clearly uh, an issue of, of great uh, common interest. There's then a, a certain amount of research that the, uh, the office gets into. Um, that research needs to be examined, um, can be done typically by a, a tripartite technical meeting or a tripartite meeting of experts. Um, from there, it goes uh, potentially, if there is a consensus to, to do it that way, to move to the governing body. And in the governing body, then a discussion takes place, or indeed, as was the case on this occasion, a vote. Uh, there is a discussion that takes place, and that is the moment when the formal standard setting process starts. Very quickly from there, what then happens is um, the governing body took a decision to um, devote a double discussion. That means two discussions at uh, the 2025 and 2026 um, conferences. So you have to have it twice on the floor of the conference. Has to be Absolutely. Twice and that is in order to allow not just for due and um, due consideration and proper reflection, but also to, be, to enable uh, the 187 uh, member states to organize consultations, particularly with uh, representatives of workers and employers, uh, as to not just whether the the standards are suitable, what, what, what exactly would have to go into, into these standards? So it goes from the governing body to discussion at the conference, then back to the governing body, and then back for a nope. second discussion? How nope. does it work? not necessarily. Um, so once a governing body has taken the decision, the office prepares a so-called law and practice report, which is a technical background report, with attached to that a questionnaire. And it's that questionnaire that governments are going to fill in and on the basis of which they will hold consultations uh, with workers and employers. That is sent back to the, the office. The office summarizes and that feeds into the first discussion at the conference. The, conf the first conference discussion produces, in principle, conclusions. These conclusions are the basis for a draft, whatever instrument has been proposed by the conference. That again goes into a national consultation process, is again summarized, gives rise to the second discussion, and then hopefully the adoption. Right. And do, does it have to be adopted um, unanimously or, or can, by a majority or what? No, it's uh, two uh, by the conference adopts international labor standards by a two thirds majority of the votes cast. So it is not unanimity. There are examples of conventions uh, in the past that have been adopted with unanimity. Uh, the most uh, recent example clearly was the worst forms of uh, child labor convention which by now, um, 20 years, a good one, 21 years actually after its adoption, was universally ratified, the first ever ILO conventions to be, uh, to be universally ratified. And these, um, I mean, a lot of these topics that are, are, are the subject of ILS, they're quite controversial topics. I mean, like uh, violence and harassment was the most recent convention. I mean, the last minute negotiations when you're sort of, 85, 90% of the way there. Um, what are those like? Well, you have to understand that adopting uh, an international labor standard is a social dialogue process. Every social dialogue process that is proper and meaningful um, takes energy, takes time, and um, eventually always focuses on a number of um, controversial issues. Um, maybe I would select another example just to... Mm. Take it into another sphere. Mm. Um, when the Maternity Protection Convention was adopted in uh, 2000, there was very considerable 
a debate around whether maternity benefits, without which maternity leave actually doesn't make a lot of sense, yeah. because, of course, uh, in the course of, of maternity, um, women need an income. That's right. You're not going to take the, um, the leave if exactly. you haven't got any income. Exactly. The question is then, what is the best way of financing uh, maternity benefits? And everyone would readily agree that a uh, social insurance system, that means pooling the risk of being confronted with women that are uh, going to take maternity leave and that will impose an additional burden on employers to find replacement. Um, everyone would agree that social insurance would be the best possible mm. way of organizing that. However, the reality is that in the world today, in many countries, the social security system is not sufficiently developed. And in that case, uh, many countries have resorted to individual employer liability, something that particularly on smaller enterprises, of course, imposes a, a big burden. Yeah. So there is language in that convention um, that um, eventually represented a, uh, a compromise, but that was difficult to reach. Was it? And are we talking kind of two o'clock in the morning um, negotiating sessions down to the wire. That is standard. Yes, yes it, it goes into particularly in the last week. It, it goes it goes into the wee hours of the morning. What did they at the World Trade Organization? What do they call it? Into the tunnel or something like that yes. for the last forty eight hours, yep. when everybody's kind of almost locked in a room with with um, curly sandwiches and and Absolute, stale water. Totally, totally. But you see. I mean, you, of course, I mean, it's, it doesn't necessarily represent decent work for the, for the representatives that are negotiating that. But the reality is that uh, it, it is an indication of, of the seriousness uh, and the dedication that uh, the many representatives, in our case, not just governments, but also workers have in, in, in coming, to, coming to a conclusion that nobody is ever perfectly happy with, but everyone can live with. Yeah, that well, that that is the purpose of, of negotiation and exactly. diplomacy, isn't it? You exactly. you 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 have to compromise. Exactly. Okay, so let, let's. Um, this is the Future of Work podcast, so mm -hmm. um, let's look forward a little bit. Um, give us a couple of predictions for where you see the current sort of activity in ILS. What, what if you're looking forward a decade? What can we expect? Do you think? Well, there is a number of items that, um, in fact, the governing body has already decided that, um, shall we say, within the next 10 years should appear on a conference agenda for standard setting purposes. Uh, three of those, actually four, um, are on occupational safety and health. Once again, the first one that we will be tackling in 24-25 is biological hazards. And that immediately relates, of course, to the uh, to the pandemic that we've uh, mm. that we're still trying to get our way uh, out of. Uh, in the the next occupational safety and health topic will be a partial revision of um, standards that we already have on chemical hazards because mm -hmm. technology, including yep. the chem uh, chemical technology, continues to evolve. Um, another one that we discovered didn't have yet standards on is um, ergonomics and, and manual handling. We do know that around the world, for example, musculoskeletal disorders are a very significant source of, uh, of, of, of injuries and, and, and diseases indeed. And then there is uh, guarding of machinery. Now, outside the occupational safety and health um, area, we will be looking, I already referred to uh, platform economy. Yeah, for the gig work. There is uh, not yet a consensus, but a considerable interest, I would say, in um, developing some sort of normative guidance around uh, supply chains, mm -hmm. given, of course, the uh, pressures that uh, globalization unharnessed tends to put on um, workers in particular down the lower levels of uh, of supply chains. And those two are interesting, of course, particularly because they are by definition cross-border. Indeed. You know, a platform platform work and is, is and correct. supply chains by definition involve a number of countries. Correct, correct. Yeah. And mm. and also because of course we do not want to forego the benefits of an open 
an open global trading trading economy. But as I said, uh, some of these forces need to be harnessed in order to make sure that, uh, to put it in the language of the 2030 development agenda, that we leave no one behind. Yes, and we don't we don't devolve down to um, the lowest common denominator or race to the bottom. We keep up the standard. So, what was the what was the fi the final one you you were going to predict for the future? One issue that is probably um, significant, um, it is also looked at within the wider UN context, is uh, uh, access to justice. So access, lack of access to justice is an important source of tension, can give uh, rise to conflict and, and eventually undermines peace. And therefore, mm -hmm. United Nations is, is obviously concerned about it. There's significant numbers of people around the world, we're talking billions, that at this point are estimated not to have access to, to justice. And part of that is labor justice. And of course, mm -hmm. the world of work is, uh, is the ILO's business. And one of the things that we will be looking at is, is to see whether we have the sufficient guidance in place to make sure that, that um, states around the world invest sufficiently in dispute settlement. And of course, one of the ILO's mottos is "If you desire peace, cultivate justice." Exactly. Although, of course, that said it in the, in the original in Latin, but I won't go there. Um, and I think the other one that's actually on the agenda of this upcoming conference is apprenticeships. Apprenticeships is one that directly came out of the I referred to it earlier, the standards review mechanism, um, which came to the conclusion that we we had uh, standards, particularly recommendations, in the past. Um, that were no longer considered up to date at the same time, particularly in the context of the need to drive productivity, to facilitate the school to, to work transition, uh, youth employment around the world being um, higher than for uh, more adult uh, categories. Um, and the role that quality apprenticeships can play in making sure that the world also has a sufficient number of um, manual labor, uh, that all contributed to a decision to say maybe we need to have standards. And the first discussion on that took place already last year in 2022, and hopefully in 2023 we'll come to a conclusion with uh, what we understand to be at this point will be a recommendation. It's interesting because um, two of the items that you've mentioned, apprenticeships applying to younger workers and ergonomics frequently applying to older workers, are reflective of one of the, um, the issues that's so much talked about now, which is getting people into the workforce and retaining people in the workforce. So I suppose that's one example of how labour standards are um, stepping up to answer some Correct. of the, the social and economic problems as they emerge in the 21st century. Yeah, correct. I mean, what international labor standards always try to do and, and what makes very often for the, the difficult negotiations that we were talking about is finding the right balance between, job, between labor market flexibility and job security. Mm. Um, and um, that's certainly also the case for, uh, for, for the standards that we were just talking about. Tim, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. We could talk about this quite a lot longer, but I think we have to leave it there. Um, so my thanks very much to you today for joining us. That was Tim DeMeyer from the International Labour Standards Department at the ILO. And if you'd like to know more about international labour standards, such as, for example, which countries have ratified which instruments, um, you can find loads of information on the ILO's website about this. But for now, let me wish you goodbye and please join us again soon for another edition of the Future of Work podcast. Goodbye.